I'm really delighted uh, that President Vicente Fox of Mexico uh, is here. Please join me. President Fox, you just here. Um, please sit down. Uh, and uh, Professor uh, Marcelo Suarez Orozco, who is an expert in globalization, immigration, uh, policy and education, and who is now a professor at New York University. Uh, President Fox, uh, people like to say that people need no introduction. It's actually true in this case. Um, as you all know, uh, he was a groundbreaking iconoclastic leader of Mexico, both in Mexican politics, the first opposition leader to be elected uh, since 1920, and incredibly important in as well as domestic politics in reshaping the North American continent and in reshaping Mexico's position in our continent. Uh, he has a lot in common with this audience as well uh, because he, it, prior to his political career, he had a very glittering business career. Uh, I see uh, Beatrice nodding because he is from the Coca-Cola family. Uh, he was the head of Coca-Cola in Mexico and Latin America, so he speaks from that experience too. Uh, and I am particularly thrilled to have President Fox here because I think um, an elephant in the room in our whole conversations over the past two days really has been the fact that we are here in Arizona. And some of the Google organizers said to me, Google being a company uh, that likes to say they do no evil, uh, some of the organizers said to me that there was pushback from within Google. And people said, why are we going to Arizona? Uh, these people are doing bad things. Uh, President Fox has been quite outspoken, uh, I think uh, very bravely, about his views of uh, Arizona's new immigration laws. And I'd like to ask you to start there, President Fox. What, what do you think the impact of these laws is, and, and, and what have they done in terms of how the United States is seen in Mexico? Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Let me just briefly say that my life has been like a football game with four quarters. One was a student, then second quarter was with this marvelous global corporation, the Coca-Cola company, where I started as a route salesman. And in 10 years, I resigned to move to family business, being president uh, for all of Latin America. Then I was in family business for a quarter, another 15 years, and uh, enjoyed the difficulties, the struggling of every day to raise for the payroll on next uh, Friday. Very difficult to run small businesses. Then I moved to my third uh, quarter, which is uh, moved into politics, into the public sector. But coming to the case of migration. I think it's, it's a debate that is totally miscited here in the States, misguided, most of it coming from that very sad day of September 11th, where fear spread out in this nation, and fear has been guiding decisions. Fear has made uh, to take the decision of building a wall when we should be building bridges to isolate, in a way, from the rest of the world, when the world is more open than ever. And so uh, that's a key ingredient on the case of migration. Migration is an asset to any nation. My grandfather migrated from Cincinnati, Ohio, down into Mexico as a migrant without a penny in his pocket. He crossed deserts, mountains, rivers, borders, and he settled in Guanajuato in Mexico. And there he found his American dream. So migration is a two-way street. And uh, when, I, when I see this great nation, which I feel part of because of my grandfather, um, I don't see why this change in leadership, this change on going on the vanguard and challenging the world for openness, 
for growth, for equal opportunities to everybody, and now has backed up to enclose within itself. I think that the decision that has been taken in Arizona is totally wrong, miscited, because the first one that is going to pay the price for that move is the same state of Arizona. They have forgotten that Mexico is a partner, that we buy from this nation more products and services than what Italy, Germany, France, and Britain do together. We account for hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of jobs for US citizens because of the imports we make into Mexico. As partners, we're building prosperity. We're building competitiveness to our nations. We are protecting our jobs from the challenge coming from Asia, from China, from India. And we have to understand that we're partners and that as partners, we can build a much better future. And finally, the human side, just mentioned by Howard. I think the human side is a key ingredient in this issue, as well as in many others. In many others, as the same corporations that work global, and that they should, as we are proposing now, together with Georgetown University, and the Gallup Corporation that by the side of each CEO, chief executive officer, should be a CCO, a chief cultural officer, working not on the markets, but on the human side of development, working on ecology and protection of natural resources, working with the community, working to build up successful communities, successful societies, successful citizens all over the world. So again, I think that we should be building bridges between our two great nations on instead of dividing through building walls. Which, by the way, those walls are being built by Mexicans also. <laughs> so you've just mentioned uh, business, President Fox. And when I talk to American business leaders, in general, they're very pro-immigration. Do you think that they have done a good enough job about raising their voices in the American political debate? Well, here we are, and I'm highly impressed of uh, having come to this meeting to see this vanguard of talent, of brains, of audacity, of innovation, as you all are. But we pretty frequently forget that human beings do their best in a scenarios of peace, of uh, prosperity, of humanity, a scenarios of a stability, and that's where we do our best. And that's what at Centro Fox we are doing, trying to build that kind of uh, economies, that kind of nations, that kind of societies where we human beings can do what we're discussing here. And governments really need to think about this and really need to think to the future and make sure that they build this kind of scenarios so that the whole world can move forward. I'd like to bring our friend Marcelo into the conversa on conversation. So Marcelo, you have studied immigration policy over time. Where, how does the debate right now fit into the American historical context? Is this, are, are people angry about immigration now than they were in the past? Um, first of all, I'm delighted to be here and to be a part of the, the conversation. And I'm especially delighted to share the platform with, uh, with President uh, Fox. As the President was speaking, I was reminded of the beautiful first line in Anna Karenina, all families are happy the same way, uh, but when it comes to immigration, all of the families of the post-industrial world are unhappy the same way, because we're caught. Hey, what about Canada, my country? 
I'm going to Toronto next week to do some cultural therapy for the things that are not working in Canada also. Uh, Canada does very, very well when it comes to immigration. But we're caught with an essential ambivalence. Um, you ask, how is what's going on today different from what happened in American history maybe 100, 150 years ago when in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, a massive wave of migration, a wave of migration that is greater than today's migration wave, was fundamentally transforming the nation. That wave of migration created great anxieties, great concerns. We love immigration looking backwards. We love to narrate the stories of our ancestors who, against fantastic odds, came to uh, emerge as engaged citizens who really built our country. In the here and now, immigration has always generated pushback. A hundred year, hundred years ago, it was uh, there were deep anxieties, deep concerns over whether Eastern Europeans could be integrated into American society, whether the Irish and the Italians could become um, members of a family that uh, had been founded by earlier waves of uh, English Protestant uh, immigrants. Today, the, the, again, serious anti-Semitism, serious anti-Catholic sentiment was at the very, very center. Today... Do you think that's comparable to the attitude towards Muslims today? Uh, well, I think 9-11 changed everything, and, and it's important not to make facile historical analogies that really don't work. The point that I do want to make is that in the in the uh, United, that was elegant, in the it? United he, States he skated around there very in, well in done the United that. States Supreme Court today uh, there are no Protestants. All members of the Supreme Court today are the descendants of those Catholics and those Jews that were once imagined as unassimilable. Uh, as um, an impossible group to bring into the family of the nation. Looking backward, all of this becomes very obvious, very ridiculous. What's important to think in the 21st century is how the story of immigration has become the human face of a global interconnected world. You can't have integrated economies. You can't have integrated uh, communications. You can't have integrated technologies without having integrated demographies. And this is what every country today in the high income world is experiencing. Very, very profound transformations moving forward as a function of the dynamics that the global integration of our economies and societies is generating tremendous demographic changes. There's one important fact, though, and one big difference from this previous big wave of immigration that you're talking about. I sometimes find myself on talk shows uh, talking about this, and one of the people I'm sometimes on talk shows with is Pat Buchanan. And one of the lines that he likes to bring up is he says, these people all broke the law. These are 11 million lawbreakers who are here. And surely we as a country have the right to enforce our laws. What's the answer to that? Can you just say, well, it's like an interconnected global economy? Well, I think that um, we're less than 5% of the global population today. We probably have roughly 20% of all unauthorized immigrants worldwide. This clearly does not work. We, the United States. The United States, less than 5% of the world's population today has probably about 20% of all illegal immigrants on Earth. This is clearly not working. It doesn't work for the 5 million children 
who woke up this morning in our country, four million of these children are citizen children still. We may one day uh, change the 14th Amendment. That's not likely to happen soon. But we have four million children, citizen children, who get up, get into buses, go to schools, and they don't know what will happen to their parents. They don't know if their parents are going to be there, are going to be deported. Last year, the United States deported 395,000 people to countries like Mexico, but throughout, uh, throughout the world. So, You wrote that very nice article about the girl in the school visited by Mrs. Obama. Correct. Yes, so here we have an example of a citizen child asking the first lady, but my mommy's afraid. Uh, you know, she doesn't know when she's going to get deported or what's going to happen uh, to her. So clearly, nobody is for illegal immigration. Illegal immigration hurts the families. Illegal immigration cheapens the value of citizenship. Illegal immigration bears the emperor. It, 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 it performs all of the frustrations we have with a governmental architecture that is not working. Sí. Yes, I fully agree with that. And uh, that's why the call is for Congress, because we're talking a federal issue here. And the way that issue has been sitting dormant at US Congress has permitted different states to come with different regulations or different laws which really is because of the empty space that has been left out by federal government. But more so, let me tell you a concept here that I listened to Colin Powell very recently at the Bohemian Grove in San Francisco, California. Are you allowed to tell us what happens at the <laughs> Bohemian Grove? Of course. <laughs> no. And uh, what he said is, this nation is missighted and it's not doing the work that it should be doing when it's not letting my minorities come into schools, minorities uh, have open opportunities equal to anybody else because he says 25 years from now, minorities will be majorities in this nation. They're going to be running this nation. And how come you deprive them from going to school or this society is not worried enough to prepare them for that future that is coming? The statistics and the population figures show that. Pretty soon, we'll have in California a Mexican governor. And we might be getting back part of our territory. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> See, he was just checking if you're listening. I'm going to ask President Fox one more question. And please, um, you have a chance to ask him one question. This is a historic opportunity to ask a historic leader something. So I want a little more energy than we had with Howard. I know Howard was sort of melancholy. It, it was hard to interrogate him. But uh, please, come on. And I'm going to ask a quick uh, question while people get up their nerve, innovative Googlers that you are. Um, the follow-up is, what about Mexico's responsibility in all of this? There, there's obviously been a lot of overheated rhetoric here, but one of the things you hear Total. a lot of coming out of Arizona is Mexican drug violence being exported into the Total United States. Total responsibility. And there is no obligation to this nation to act different than what it's been doing. That's why I'm calling this miscited. It's not treating fair your partner. It's not seeing at the future of how your economy will be competitive. It's not looking at who is going to be harvesting the apples in Washington State, who is going to be harvesting the agricultural fields of California, who is going to be building the buildings in Las Vegas or anywhere else. Uh, so it's, it's just a way to see this and an invitation to use talent, to use intelligence, like leaders do, like you use. And by the way, at Central Fox, we understand leadership as something that every single human being has within. We are all leaders. We're leaders all the time of our life. 
and we're leaders in any activity that we choose to work upon in our lives. The big problem, most everywhere, is that many of us don't go within ourselves, don't learn about our leadership, don't uh, learn about our capacities, and do not commit ourselves. So you don't create leaders. We're all leaders, and what you do is to facilitate that everybody makes this exercise and come up with that strong, passionate, compassionate leadership and big aspirations for heroic goals. That is what we should all do, like that big graph there. That's as far, and maybe not even that far, that every single human being can reach. If you only discover your leadership, if you only are aware of the power that we all have within. And renewal, renewal, which we've been hearing all these magnificent stories here, Dipra Chopak puts it very simple. Gift yourself with five minutes of reflection every day. And then, maybe you don't need the call of cancer that Blaze had. Maybe you don't need the September 11th to react with your own corporation and with the, your own humanity. If you commence every day on this new beginning and you work new ideas to the future, you can every day be doing better things, great things, heroic things. Okay, let's hear from some of the leaders here with their questions, please. Very much. Uh, I am an Austrian citizen and I live in Mexico. I immigrated there and I just wanted to say I'm very happy that there are no walls at any border, otherwise I would not be there. Uh, my question is, uh, what do you think, uh, President Fox, uh, what did trigger the drug war in Mexico and how long do the citizens have to wait until this is going to be, come to a, not to an end, but to a uh, livable situation? Well, with all respect, uh, we in Mexico just happen to be in between the huge, the mammoth U.S. market of drug consumption and the countries that produce it down south, the Venezuelas, the Colombias, the Bolivias. And we're paying the price because one president, whose name is Felipe Calderón, decided that he must cut the supply of drugs to this nation and that he must cut the supply of drugs to our youth in Mexico. And then we're in this war that is not our drugs, our war, because the money to nourish that war is coming from this market, this huge consumer market. Billions of US dollars come down south every year. And the weapons, the ammunition, each and every one of those comes from this nation down to Mexico. So what's the so answer? Do it's a joint responsibility. We have to work together. And that's why I'm totally for depenalizing not only drug consumption, but drug production, drug distribution, and the selling of drugs. I think that we must separate. Legalizing? Yes. How far? Legalizing? Total. Absolutely total. At the very end, it's our own responsibility of the users, of the consumers. I mean, you don't limit the consumer to get Coca-Cola because it has caffeine. <laughs> Just give them the Coca-Cola. That's going to be the I headline, mean, Beatrice. <laughs> Coca-Cola is the same as the, drugs and should be legal. Nations, <laughs> the nations that have taken this step have suffered no increase in drug consumption, like Holland. Or this nation, when it finally ended up the prohibition back in the 20s of last century, you ended up with the capos and with the crime that extended in the area of Chicago. So prohibitions don't work. At the very end, it's the consumer. It's the user of drugs that has to react, has to protect his own health, has to be pretty aware of the harm that he's doing to himself and the family education and the school system education. Imagine a world where you have drugs that are 
depenalized and that are legal and that you tax them with a 1,000% over and above the price cost. Then you are on a market and the, mon the money you can raise there, it will be more than enough to reduce drug consumption like societies in this nation or in Mexico have been able to reduce smoking and liberated many, many people that were to die. In the case of Mexico, there is not more than 1,000 people that die for overdoses. And this war has costed in the last four years 28,000 people killed. Or if we take cigarettes or if we take alcohol, it's tens of thousands of people that die for that. Why is a nation paying such a high cost on tourism, on investment, on talent that is leaving the country to protect that 1,000? I mean, let's leave it to them to decide whether they would consume or not. And finally, I would take out the army, bring it back to their headquarters, and use police on instead. Because there's a lot of problems with the presence of the army on the streets. A lot of human rights violations, a lot of uh, non-due judiciary process that every citizen deserves. So we must do some changes. We must think, like the guys that passed through this stage this morning, innovation, new ideas, new ways to confront this problem. We have to think laterally and go beyond this war that we're faced with right now. Okay, well, uh, our time has come to an end. We've had a red light for a few minutes, but uh, I uh, introduced yes. President Fox as an innovative and iconoclastic leader, and I think he has certainly lived up to that billing in the conversation here. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, and thank you very much, Marcelo, for helping us to understand in a broader context these very heated issues. Um, great pleasure. pleasure. Thank you very much.